Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. We've got a couple more people um, who are hoping to join, so uh, uh, they can join during the meeting. But um, thanks for joining this afternoon. Um, it's a, a quite a special sort of um, select band of people that were, were welcome into this meeting. So it's a, going to be a, a, an interesting talk with um, we welcome Mags Cousins, who's been doing some work with us this year on mollusks on some of our sites. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the Desmoulin world snail, which is a quite a rare species and um, local in its habit. Um, and it's actually uh, hopefully occurring still on Jones's Mill Reserve in Pusey. Um, so I'll I'm recording the meeting and uh, I'll hand over to Max so that she can tell us more about this interesting species. Thanks, Max. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, lovely to see everyone. So the, those, of, uh, those of you who haven't joined, I suppose they're, they've fallen asleep after their Sunday lunch. <laughs> uh, thank you, Michael, for organising this and indeed the other sessions we've had on mollusks down in Wiltshire. Wiltshire is quite important for this species, as you'll see shortly. So I'd just like to say thank you also to Martin Willing, who did quite a lot of the work behind this presentation. Martin's also a member of the Conchological Society. And so my day job is actually senior specialist for plants and caraphytes at Natural England. Um, but it was this species of mollusk that sparked my interest initially in mollusks and their importance, and it grew from there. And I'm now a conservation officer at the Conchological Society. So today, um, I am going to uh, give you a presentation. Hang on, sorry, let's, let me catch up with myself. I'm going to share my screen. and start my presentation. So just to make sure I've got the right screen shared, because I'm working on double screens here. <laughs> Have you got a full screen view of my slides? Um, it's sort of part of the screen, but it's probably yeah. uh, what we're what we're looking at is sort of um, <clears throat> your screen, and then what the next slide's going to be. Okay, so that's not ideal. Yeah, um, I think it's the the presenter's view. Yes. Oh, someone's going to have to remind me how to get off presenter's view. Uh, I think be. the three little dots underneath your presentation. I think there. You can do it. Um, I'd present a view. How about that? Is that better? Good. Looking good. So it'd be good if I could get rid of the Zoom part of it. So can you also see? We we just got the 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 better? the the presentation now. So let's go. Ah, excellent. Okay, lovely. Right, yeah. So that's the first first slide. Oh, so, so thanks yeah. to Martin Willing for helping with this presentation. Martin Willing was the previous conservation officer at the Conchological Society. I took over from him a couple of years ago. So uh, today we're doing an online introduction to the conservation importance of this species, how to distinguish between Desmoulins and other lookalike species of the same and different families in theory, and then later on in the field. A brief introduction to the keys to identify terrestrial snails. Hopefully we'll have an understanding of the ecology and habitat requirements and be able to recognize suitable habitat by the end of this presentation. And then later on next Saturday, we'll also be able to actually practice sampling for the snail in the field at the Vera Jeans Wildlife Trust Reserve. And I'm going to tell you a little bit today about applying the standard methodology for that. Um, and we can practice elements of that on site next Saturday. So this is a two part session and hopefully you will be able to join on Saturday. 
So why does this species require all this level of training? <laughs> well, it is quite small. Um, this is an adult of the snail, and that is a Carex acutiformis leaf, so lesser pond sedge. Uh, so the small size and similarity to other species in the same habitat and its conservation importance mean that it does require a little bit of in-depth training. And so the protective designations for this species, there are a few. Uh, it was decreed vulnerable under a IUCN a status review in 2014. It's a section 41 species under the NERC Act 2006, so a, a species of principal importance. And it's also a European protected species, an Annex 2 species. So there's a requirement for the UK to report, or there was, <laughs> a requirement to report under Article 17 on the status of the UK population. So this is reporting to Europe. Obviously, things have changed slightly in that respect, so probably um, less said about that at the moment, the better. But as far as we know, we're going to have to continue reporting for the time being. So the distribution of the species. It's actually a sort of Atlantic Mediterranean species in that it occurs from Ireland uh, westward right across to Poland and slightly beyond, and in a north-south direction from North Africa up to Sweden. So the shaded areas are the main distribution centres. And everywhere it's threatened by habitat loss, basically, or habitat alteration. Um, hence the European protected status. So the approximate UK distribution this is the 1999 Atlas of Mollusks on the right-hand side. Um, so you can see the dots represent the occurrences of the species, and it has a southeasterly kind of tendency and also central Ireland. So the strongholds were previously considered to be the floodplain fens of the southeast rivers, fens of East Anglia, and Central Island with a few other isolated occurrences, which have been known about for a long time. So there's a tiny dot over in the uh, Shropshire Midland Mears. There's a dot down on Cornwall, which is a dune um, coastal fen. And there's just another sort of representation of that on the left, that sort of band running across the southeast to East Anglia was considered the stronghold. However, since this atlas was produced in 1999, Martin Willing has since found further significant sites in mid Wales. And I was instrumental in finding several more important populations in the Midlands Mears. So previously there was just the one known about, and now there's at least five. And some of them really significant populations. So they're not new populations, they would have been there before but due to lack of expertise and survey and nobody searching, they weren't known about. Um, so there may still be other populations, perhaps even in your area that aren't yet known about. It turns out in fact that the Midland Mears populations are more stable and sometimes more significant than the Southeast River floodplains, which are declining. So there's serious declines in the Southeast, which we'll look at a bit later. So zooming in a little bit to southern England and the distribution of Desmoulin's well snail in southern England with a red circle around the Vera Jeans Reserve, Jones's Mill SSI. So you can see that this reserve is actually at the headwater of the River Avon, uh, which is quite important in many respects, which we'll look at a bit later. And zooming in further, this is the River Avon SAC, so special area of conservation. And as Millions is a notified feature of the River Avon SAC. Therefore, it has been surveyed and monitored fairly rigorous, rigorously. And these figures here, they're, sorry, they're all a bit small, but it shows you the sampling that's been done by Martin, Martin Willing and the 
numbers, the counts he's made in particular years, survey years. And again, Vera Jean's reserve in the red circle right at the top there, showing green, actually green for stable or thought to be stable. Whereas elsewhere, we've got some red downward arrows and red circles, which represent loss. And the trends, again, we've got green, amber and red, red for loss. So <clears throat> overall, there's actually been a severe decline in this sack for the species. And the Vera Jean's reserve right at the top of the catchment is actually one of the more stable populations and is therefore very important or has been stable in the past. So we, it will be good to have a look on Saturday, see what we can find. So I'll just bring up all these stats. So from Martin's data, there's been a 63% confirmed loss of sites, uh, which is very, very serious. 15% uh, were confirmed present by his surveys, but some of the sites, as in locations of known populations, were not surveyed, possibly because they looked unsuitable and he knew that they weren't going to be there or he couldn't access them. And in many cases, those are probably also lost. So very serious declines. And the causes are thought to be primarily drought or low river flows, but also flooding. So we'll look at a bit later why drought and flooding, the two opposites, are problems for this species. So we've got low flows and flooding, but also eutrophication is probably an issue, which affects both the plants that the species um, attaches to and the surface film of algae and bacteria on those plants, which the snails graze on. So lots of interacting factors. I will also look into the hydrological requirements um, in detail in a, in a little, little while. Um, but we do need to note that long-term data sets are essential to determine trends for this type of annual species. And again, we'll look in detail in a moment about what that actually means to be an annual species. So the species experiences wide fluctuations in numbers, but can bounce back quite rapidly um, given the right conditions. So back to the animal, what does it actually look like? Vitigo melanziana is one of 11 vitigo species that occurs in the UK, and one of four that have protected conservation designations. And I've circled it there. It's one of the larger of the vitigos or vertigos. I don't really know how you actually supposed to pronounce these things. Um, so the four protected species are very habitat specific and with a restricted distribution. Basically they're glacial relics. So they are found in long established habitats with a stable hydrological regime and a cool temperate climate. Other vitigo species are quite widespread, but they're all indicators of decent semi-natural habitat. And there is some overlap in their habitat preferences. So at Vera Jeans, there are also vitigo, anti-vitigo, if I get my cursor, get my cursor on it, sorry, it's a little bit blurry. So anti-vitigo is in this uh, top corner. Sorry, that's an angustia, where's it gone? Gayer eye, pig maybe, lily buggy eye. Here we go. Here's Antipatigo. So it actually looks quite similar, but is smaller. Uh, we've also got um, Pygmaea, Patigo Pygmaea at Veragines. So that's even smaller. <laughs> <laughs> and we might also have uh, Substriata at Veragines, uh, which has some kind of, um, it has kind of striations on the surface. So those three species are all of slightly drier, more grassy wetland habitats, but there can be overlap. So looking in a little bit more detail again at the actual species, how to identify it. So an adult would be 
2.2 to 2.7 millimeters tall. So it's not very big, but it is the biggest of the vitigos. <laughs> so it has four and a half to five whorls in total. And the body whorl forms a very significant part of the shell height in this species. So it's, so it's large in size with a large body whorl and both of those are diagnostic. Many of the vitigos have teeth in the aperture and these again are diagnostic. So for Mulanziana, usually has one parietal tooth. Uh, so that's this region at the top of the aperture. Usually has two palatal teeth, which is this region here, and one to two columnar teeth. And that's that region on the left-hand side. And the lip of the aperture in a fully grown adult is quite flared. So those are all significant features. Um, the fact that it's translucent, translucent reddish brown is not particularly useful because lots of the snails are that coloration. So that's all very well for adults, but snails have to grow and they start out as a very tiny creature indeed. So we've got the one millimeter scale at the bottom and a juvenile on the right hand side. So this juvenile is slightly less than a millimeter in width and in height. And then they grow by adding whorls to the shell until on the right hand side, you've got a fully formed adult showing off its fully formed teeth and the flared aperture. Something's gone slightly wrong with this diagram in that the fully formed adult looks narrower than the next one along, but that's not the case. So a little bit about habitat. Typically, the habitat of this species is wet, lowland, calcareous fens and marshes. And the characteristic plants are large sedges, reed sweet grass, particularly in the southeast, and common reed. And there is a sort of standardised condition assessment for this species, and the the vegetation is being classified: class class one, two, three, and four. Class one being the most favourable, and class four being the least favourable. And this basically was devised by Ian Killeen, who found that the abundance of Vitigo mulanziana was greatest in vegetation that basically comprised those species in the class one category, going right through declining in abundance to class four, which is basically unsuitable. And the two in between, classes two and three, are slightly suboptimal. So let's have a look at some examples. I'm sure you're all familiar, especially since it's your area, with riparian fen. So floodplain fen, as in the River Avon catchment, especially where the river and the floodplain remain connected, interactive, without artificial drainage in the floodplain, without modification to the river, i.e. altering the channel to be more of a drainage ditch than an um, active dynamic river. So basically where fen has been allowed to continue to exist on the channel margins and in complex wetlands across a natural floodplain. Now you can imagine those habitats are quite restricted now. So fen, that vegetation type is part of the hydrosphere from open water to dry habitats. So this is a riverine situation, but it also, fen also occurs around lakes. So this is an example of lake marginal fen. You can't actually see much of the open water here. In fact, you can't see any, but it is fen on the edge of Burton Mill Pond in Sussex. So quite a large pond, more or less a lake. So this is class one vegetation as well. It's dense sedge, very wet underneath. Also on the hydrozero transition is swamp. Uh, so deeper water, larger emergent species here on the edge of a lake, a mix of Carex riparia, typha, reed. It's tend to be slightly less favorable, um, perhaps due to exposure to the winds that can whip across lakes, 
um, dislodgement by wave action. So slightly less favorable. We've also got a situation here where there's fen in a car woodland. So car woodland is also a fen type really. So where you've got not too dense, uh, a scrub and woodland cover with dense sedge underneath, then you've got some good Mulanziana habitat. And this is very typical of the Midlands mears where there's still a good transition around the open water. So here, this is Carex cutiformis, um, but tussock forming sedges are also good, such as greater tussock sedge. The key is sufficient density of sedge to maintain sheltered, humid conditions for the snail with very wet, well, wet to very wet conditions underneath. And in the Midlands Mears, usually this would be peat because they're long established wetlands where peat has been able to accumulate. So a different sort of situation is reed bed. And there is a population here at Pool Harbour, but pure reed starts to get a little bit suboptimal and is basically a sort of class two in terms of vegetation suitability. Other types of fen, fen meadow, uh, so a little bit higher up the hydrocereal transition, you'd find fen meadow. These are often affected by management, grazing, cutting, possibly drainage. So perhaps a slightly more unstable or tenuous environment, but where the fen meadow maintains a stable hydrology, then these can also be important. So this is the North Cornwall site, or it was a few years ago. I don't actually know what it looks like now. Another fen meadow. This is looking towards Coisley Mere, one of the Cheshire Midlands Mears. So at this point, it's grazed, damp fen meadow, which doesn't usually have standing water, but be can become an in inundated. This mere retains a very extensive transition zone, which provides resilience for the species, at, well, and the wetland altogether. Although this actual location here near the post is somewhat suboptimal. It's soft rush dominated, maybe mixed species, waterman, willow herb. It's kind of a suboptimal class three vegetation. But when you've got rising water levels that pushes the species off the dense sedge on the margins of the mere, this transitional zone can be very important as a refuge for the species and would provide resilience to erratic weather patterns, which we're seeing now. But this transitional habitat is often the lost habitat because certainly the case around the Mears, there can be a sudden change from the lake edge to improve grassland or arable even. And probably the same can be said in the floodplains of the Southeast. So just the last couple of examples to get to know the habitat types. Uh, fen can also be groundwater fed, so an upwelling of base rich water. So these are not necessarily on peat, they can be mineral um, soils, but again could create this class one level of vegetation, dense sedge, damp underneath. And this is the most unusual for the species, cliffside flush. Um, so seepage, base rich uh, rocks, constant seepage, you get a good stable environment. So you've noticed, I think, probably, that hydrology is the key, one of the key factors. So water at or near to ground surface for most of the year is the ideal for Mulanziana. And we've got a bit of a chart here to indicate what's the most favourable um, in terms of hydrology for the population. So the highest population you get where water level is usually more than 25 centimetres above the surface, where the fluctuation is not usually more than 60 centimetres. Uh, so the ground surface, the water level is never or very rarely falls below ground level 
So that's your ideal, that sustains a dense sedge bed and lovely humid conditions for the snail. And then where you've got slightly less water, it drops below the surface sometimes, you get a fluctuation from below to above ground, but it never reaches much more than 20 centimetres above ground, starting to get less favourable. Low populations where the surface is rarely inundated. So the surface is rarely wet. Mostly the water is subsurface. So it'd still be a, a damp habitat type, but not really suitable for the species in any numbers. So what about the other habitat requirements then? Well, obviously these are interrelated with hydrology. But shelter and shade, it not only provides phys physical protection from drying out and battering winds and rain, um, but the shading can affect the herb layer and humidity. So a degree of shading suppresses um, to vigorous of sub uh, a mid-story and sub-shrub layer. Um, and it also keeps the humidity. But if the shade is too heavy, that can lead to too sparse a sedge layer and the ground floor becomes too sparse. Um, but also shading, dense shading, properly affects the surface film of algae on which the snails are feeding. But this aspect is poorly understood. Uh, so these images here sort of indicate a fairly optimal level of shading for the species. You can see some gaps in the canopy there. There's a reasonably dense sedge bed still. Right, so a little bit about the life cycle. Many snails, most snail species, in fact, probably are hermaphrodite. So they can self fertilize, which means that in optimal conditions, all the snails can breed and so you get a rapid increase in the population. They're not very long lived though, small species don't tend to be very long lived and more or less they have an annual life cycle so they will be growing from juvenile to adult and breeding all within one year and dying out at the end of the year. Some possibly can live for slightly longer than a year. And as soon as the species have reached adulthood in a year, those can breed as well. And that can, in good conditions, maybe take a few weeks, months. Um, so that's how you get to have such large fluctuations annually, but also year to year, depending on conditions. So some studies have shown that the lowest snail numbers are at about June, that period of time maybe 50 uh, per meter squared. This is in ideal habitat, peaking to typically a maximum of about 600 animals per meter squared in October. And there have been really high numbers occasionally recorded. So many thousands per meter squared in suitable habitat. However, you can actually survey for snails in this species throughout the year, and you can still find reasonable numbers at other times of year, but the best time to look is in October, which is what we're going to try and do <laughs> on Saturday. So a little bit about dispersal. So these small uh, snail species, they can be dispersed on the feet of waterfowl or on dislodged vegetation that just across the water. They can be dispersed by flooding itself, so they're dislodged by the flood water. They can remain uh, waterborne for a while and survive as a uh, floating. They are an air breathing mollusk, so they can't survive being submerged for long, but they can float for a while. And this means that they can disperse in flood water. But if flooding is prolonged and at the wrong wrong time of year, as in during breeding season, this can suppress the populations. 
So what are the main threats to this species? I'll just bring all these up. We got another one. No, that was all of them. Right, so the main threats are a fall in water table, so a prolonged fall in water table, or prolonged flooding. So a fall in water table is too dry, the species basically desiccates, the food source probably also desiccates, and if it's prolonged, it can affect the vegetation it, it inhabits. Prolonged flooding, all the opposite reasons. But also successional change, where there's no um, cutting or grazing at all, scrubbing encroachment and shading could impact the species. But if cutting and grazing is too excessive, too severe, again, that can impact the species. Invasive non-native species, particularly in a riverine edge situation, we're thinking about Himalayan balsam, that can negatively impact the species. So overall, basically, removal and alteration of the fen. And as I said earlier, the truncation of the transition, transitional wetland habitat. So there's nowhere for it to go when conditions are suboptimal in its fen that it's normally inhabiting. If there's nowhere for it to go during flooding or desiccation, then it is a bit trapped and isolated. And that increasing isolation can make it increasingly difficult for recolonization to occur following adverse events. So this is the island biogeographical effect that we've known about for a long time. The isolated populations are more prone to extinctions. And also there's the possibility of inbreeding depression, although we know very little about that. And it may be less of an issue for a small hermaphrodite species. But those are some of the threats and you can see how climate change, particularly for the first two of those, might be quite serious. So survey and monitoring and the target state for these species. So the attributes, we've got the attributes on the left and the targets on the right. So if we were to be doing a proper condition assessment, we'd be looking at the area of occupancy by the snail. And our target would be no decline in the area previously known to be occupied. Or you might set a target for increase, depending on what's happened in the past. Plant species composition, again, that needs to be optimal for the species. So assuming it was optimal before, we're looking for no significant change in the species composition. Ground moisture levels, it needs to be not too dry, but not uh, too much flooding either. Scrub cover and shading, the optimum is about 65% in the Midland Mears for scrub growth. Obviously, it's slightly different in the riverine fen situation. So we might be saying up to 65%, or we might need to modify these targets slightly depending on the site. And then at the bottom, we've got the snail population. This can only really be done by a long-term data set, no significant population change, or you might have set a target for increase but you certainly don't want to decrease. And vegetation height, something else you can measure, um, but it's quite tricky. Um, so no significant decrease in vegetation height at the site, or you might even set a target for no significant increase if there's a problem with scrub encroachment. So when to survey? Uh, best in dry weather, just rain makes it really, really awkward. The snails stick to the vegetation, it's hard to get them and it's just difficult. Um, best done in still weather, uh, not following strong wind because snails can be dislodged from the vegetation, the vegetation gets flattened and then basically it's just harder to find them. But all year is possible. But like I said earlier, peak numbers in autumn. So finding the snail. We've learned how to identify suitable fen habitat. We've got the timing, but now we need to get the snails from the vegetation into something you can easily look at. 
So basically you need to beat vegetation or shake leaf litter into a white or pale yellow tray. Item number one. <laughs> you can use a sieve to sieve out the larger pieces of leaf litter, etc. And that's a just a round soil garden sieve on the right there, number two. But most importantly, I think number three, magnification. Head specs are really useful because it leaves your hands free, but you can also use hand lens times 10 or 20 magnification or field microscopes because you're going to need to look at the small features of the snail to make sure you've got your identification correct. So actually obtaining the sample then, the techniques to use in the field. So we can literally just grab a bunch of sedge in your hand hand protected with a glove because these things are quite sharp edged, the sedges. Shake or beat it with a stick into your plastic tray or onto a plastic sheet, ideally gridded. And the reason for ideally gridded is that helps with the counting. Um, but you can also use vacuum sampling to suck up um, small species. And then you tip your little net after vacuuming it into the tray. Or you can bag up litter samples which are taken away for drying and lab analysis later. That's particularly useful if you're short of time in the field, but it is a destructive technique. So that's, if you've not used this before, what vacuum sampling technique looks like. It's basically a commercial leaf uh, sucker and blower with a little net at the end and you hoover up the snail and other debris and other species, tip it into your white tray and see what you've got. You might have an awful lot of species, um, particularly if you've picked up leaf litter. So what you'll need to do is sort to find your actual Milanziana. And I do find a binocular microscope really useful for this. So this is what you're aiming for, a beautiful sample of there's Moulin's well snail, and then you're able to count the number of fully formed adults as opposed to the number of juvenile, juveniles and subadults. And if you sampled a fixed area of habitat, suitable habitat, uh, whether it's by beating, vacuuming or collecting litter, it enables you to make a count and some semblance of standardization. And I'm not gonna dwell on this much, but just, as I'm sure you're aware, there are, you might need to adapt your survey and monitoring technique for your site, the shape of the site, and the amount of time you can spend sampling, because basically you want to maximize your sampling effort, which tells you in the most efficient way possible how many snails you've got, how much suitable habitat. So you might be doing transects, you might be doing grids, you might be sampling on a longitudinal, sorry, on a, um, a linear habitat like alongside a river, or if it's a patch of fen in a basin, then you'll have a different sort of sampling strategy. And also you'll need to think about your frequency um, because you're gonna be aiming for a long-term data set to find out your long-term trends in populations. So just a little bit more about hydrology. It's so, so important for this species. So there's a standardized scale of what's suitable and what's less suitable for the species. And basically the three green ones in the middle, numbers two, three, and four are the most suitable for the species. So moisture's just been graded one to five because that's easy to do in the field. Basically, you call it dry, number one, if there's no visible moisture on the ground. It's damp if the ground is visibly damp, but water does not rise if pressed, i.e. when you're standing on it, you haven't got water starting to accumulate around your boot. Three, it's uh, classified as wet when water does appear under the light pressure of your boots on the fen. Very wet if there are pools of water present, but they're less than five centimetre in depth and then submerge the whole sample site is underwater more than five centimeters in depth. Now 
as um, it's just worth noting here, if ever you come to the Midland Mears to sample up here, actually the a lot of the sedge beds in the Midland Mears can withstand the deeper end of this scale and you'll still get good numbers of, of the snail. Sorry, <laughs> deeper end of this scale where you still get large numbers of the snail. But generally speaking, that region two to four is most suitable for Desmoulins. So this chart just helps you determine what's favorable and what's unfavorable should you be doing this for the species. Uh, so I'm not gonna dwell on this. Um, this might be of more interest to those of you who have been asked to determine favorable and unfavorable. So we're looking at the population, the size, and you'll have to review previous information to know whether it's increasing and whether the area of occupancy has changed. And we've got two states there, the favorable and unfavorable states. So obviously if the area occupancy has declined by 20, 21 to 40%, then that's uh, regarded as unfavorable. And then we've got a vegetation category, a favorable state and an unfavorable state and the ground moisture levels favorable and unfavorable states there. And if you've got 80% or more of your samples with the satisfactory moisture levels, then you've got favorable ground moisture conditions for the species. So you talk about what's favorable in terms of population, vegetation and ground moisture levels. And that helps you determine whether or not your site is still favorable or unfavorable for the species. So there is a standardized, more or less standardized method So I'm sure I don't need to run through this with experienced naturalists such as yourselves, but your list of equipment that you're going to need for surveying. So a tray, a tray is essential. Gloves, I find essential. Um, those sedges can absolutely shred your hands. Obviously, your field recording sheet, GPS. Um, magnifying lens, unless you've got exceptional eyesight that's going to be essential as well. And then other things to help you, obviously, tape measure, site map, camera, polythene bags for samples. If you run out of time to do all of this in the field, you can take samples away with you. And if you don't want to get wet feet, wellies or waders. <laughs> so and uh, just a little bit then about the identification and lookalike species. So here's your Desmoulin snail. Nice big fat vitigo, big body whirl, plenty of teeth in the aperture and a flared lip. What else have we got that looks like that in this sort of habitat? Well, there's a species called Columella edentula, uh, which is also a sort of small but cylindrical shaped species. It's taller for its width than vitigo and a bit smaller generally, but has no teeth whatsoever in the aperture. So you're going to need to be able to see that in the field. What else have we got? We've got vitigo antivitigo, which I mentioned earlier. It's a bit smaller than Melanziana, tends to be a bit darker, smaller body whirl, and some very significant teeth, usually more numerous in the aperture than the Desmoulin snail. And then the very tiny Vitigo pygmaea does look rather similar to both of the others, but it is very, very small. Also, we have these two species, Laura cylindracea. That's quite a common species with quite a wide habitat um, tolerance range actually, can be in woodland, can be in open habitats, uh, can be in reasonably wet places and slightly drier places. Again, it's small, a similar size in fact, uh, but slightly sort of more oblong in that it's, um, it's a bit taller for its width. Um, but the significant thing about Laria is that it has a single tooth. As a fully formed adult, it has a single tooth in the aperture. 
if you can see my cursor, not sure whether you can, the tooth is actually connected in the adult to the lip and actually forms in the juvenile. And you can see how it sort of connects and appears then in the mouth. Um, so if you flip over a juvenile and you can see these white marks, that's part of the tooth that's going to appear here. So that helps you out with that species. Um, then we've got Pupilla muscorum, which I don't think we'll see at Vera Jeans actually, which is lucky in a way, because this one is quite difficult. Looks very similar to Laria, um, with a little bit of a bump for a tooth, but it's not connected to the lip. Um, tends to be in dampish or drier calcareous habitats. Um, so those are just a few of the lookalikes. And this is your go to field key for terrestrial snails. Uh, so although it occurs in wetland, it's still regarded as a terrestrial snail. Um, it's not aquatic. It's dependent on wetland terrestrial habitats. Um, so this is a good guide for um, for providing photos and illustrations. Sorry, illustrations, not photos in this one. Um, it's got a good easy access key, lovely descriptions, and it's very good value. So don't hesitate to get it if you don't have it and you're going to be doing snail survey of any kind. Uh, if you do have ID queries, if you take photos of the four views, so that's the top of the snail, the bottom, the side view and the aperture, and also provide a scale in millimetres and the habitat type. There are some people out there who can help, perhaps via the Kongsok Twitter account. Uh, there's also our website with ID and resources. There are two Facebook groups which help with ID. They're not officially Conchological Society, but the admin people behind those are Conchological Society members. There's one called the Land and Freshwater Mollusca of Britain and Europe. And there's one called the British Marine Mollusca. Um, also, you can email me directly and Martin and one or two others in the society. Um, some books on the subject. There are other books. Uh, some of them are a little bit old and the um, nomenclature has changed, uh, but useful illustrations, photos, etc. And um, Cameron and Kearney are some of the major conchologists, malacologists who've who've done these um, books in the past. So just a little bit about recording. Um, you're all naturalists, so you know the four W's: who, what, where, and when. For mollusks, you can submit your records via iRecord, and these will be verified by Dr. Ben Rosen, who's our national non-marine recorder and slug expert. You can include your photos with iRecord, uh, which will help him determine. Um, the Conchological Society does the recording and maintaining the atlas, and the data set goes in full to the NBN atlas. So you can search there for previous records. So that about wraps up what I was going to uh, say to you. Um, hopefully you'll be able to join us at the Vera Jeans Reserve, Jones's Milter Plus I on the field visit next Saturday. And that is a view of the boardwalk with the fen either side. So I am going to open it back up to uh, Michael and take questions if you have any. And I might even stop sharing my screen now. There we are. <laughs> Thanks, Max. That was yeah. uh, a really great presentation, as usual, from you. And really, sort of, uh, you really make it, uh, you know, easy for us to understand and a good presentation, as always. Um, I hope so. I felt like I was galloping a bit. So sorry if it was. Oh, I thought it was, yeah, it's really good. And, you know, so make, with all these different training things we do, it's amazing how you sort of really get enthusiastic about it. So uh, I'm sure everyone will agree, you know, it's really makes me want to get out and look for the species. So yeah, uh, looking forward to Saturday. Be yeah, interesting. Definitely. Yeah, very.
Although um, it's probably had a tough year again. Yeah. Yeah. What with the heat and drought. So, you know, yeah. we'll just have to see. Yeah, it's like you said in your talk, and I noted it down, but you know, climate change might have uh, something to to say about its uh, populations. And the other thing that I got from your uh, information was the importance of uh, the reserve as being the headwater, yeah. because you know, if uh, if the population on the reserve stays healthy, then they can mm. filter down to all those other sites where they've sort of uh, yeah. reduced in number. So that was something I really got from that. that Absolutely, slide. yeah. So that is at pole position at yeah, the top of the position, catchment yeah. in the headwaters. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, luckily we've got some good people looking after the site, so hopefully it'll get even better. Um, Excellent. Just to ask anyone, uh, if you've got any questions, um, please just uh, ask them now. I've, I've yeah. got one, which uh, I don't know if I'm relevant it is. I'm very new to mollusks, so this was all informative and the pace was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Angela. Um, is there going to be any issue where they're introducing beavers now, um, which are obviously helping us with regards to the floodplains and um, detracting from flooding downstream? But is that going to affect the survival of um, the Desmolands? Yeah, very well observed, Angela. Um, yeah, beavers can impact a wetland quite quickly. I don't know whether you've you've seen any sort of beaver enclosures before and after or sort of heard about how quickly they build dams to retain water to make the environment suitable for them because they need water up to about 70 centimetres mm. depth to feel safe so they can swim underwater and evade predators in that depth of water and they can access food sources by swimming underwater but also they can collect woody debris and take it back to the lodge um, to store for food and to build other dams and that's easiest if they can pull it down into water and swim back with it. So you could see a situation where you've got a remnant small area of dense sedge fen left in a wetland and if beavers feel the need to create more open water at greater depth quickly, then you could see a impact on that remnant veg, that remnant bit of fen, the dense sedge. However, that's not gonna happen every time. So let's think of a few examples. The Midlands Mears, we've got a big lake with sedge fen all the way around in a big transitional area the beavers have got hectares of water they're not really going to need to do any damming to create more water in that situation so you might see very little impact from a population of beavers on the amount of open water on the extent of sedge you might see a beneficial effect because they're going to start coppicing the willow because they're going to be feeding so in a situation like that you might think great the beavers are actually managing the scrub for us now which we've had to do by hand before and it grows extremely rapidly uh, the willow bounces back around the midlands mears so that's a situation where i think the beavers can only be beneficial and when they're a bit bored with the the lake or they're start, starting to explore or their populations are maybe expanding up the tributary streams and ditches they'll start to dam those and actually we'll get an increase in sedge and fen and wetland so that's great well, they could be more beneficial that although they make this they might displace them but by displacing them they yeah. may create more uh, yes habitat or transitional yeah but where the displacement is very rapid and there isn't yet any sedge fen transitional vegetation for them to refuge in or to just be displaced to, then you could have an impact in the short term. Mm. And if it's very rapid, the flooding of the, the fen that, that harboured this remnant small population, then you, you could actually see a detrimental impact on a species like Desmoulins. 
So I think the key is to look at each situation and make an assessment. So it's been more Predict like... what beavers might do. Do yeah. they have enough water as it is? What's going to happen to this remnant bit of fen here that harbours this protected species? Are we going to need to manage the beavers a little bit to do it a bit more gradually? So take down dams so that we've got a gradual transition rather than a, a very rapid change. So it might be a greater view of deciding the introduction sites more than anything. Yeah. And to take a sort of longer ecological view of, OK, so beavers are going to start to impact this population. But are we going to have suitable conditions for the sedge to expand into, which actually can be quite quick in itself wetland vegetation does tend to recover very quickly you know you can see within a couple of years sedge beds expanding where we've done artificial bed level raising and stuff i've been very pleased by how quickly the fen has expanded and the desmoulins follows um so it's going to be very situation dependent and i think you know where you have got a beaver reintroduction and you've got protected species like this that are dependent on a certain hydrological regime it's well worth putting the time in to, to try and predict and think about you know what's likely going to happen what might we need to do to mitigate slightly until in the long term the beavers created more wetland sedge has expanded and generally all the wetland species start to benefit from what the beavers are doing brilliant thank you that's answered really well I have a question as well, quickly. Um, yep. the, 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 the picture you showed about the status in the, the River Avon sack was um, a bit depressing, but you know, mm. not the only species in the River Avon or, or other yeah. similar river systems. Mm. But is that is that a similar picture for the other systems? Like in the, well, you mentioned the Mears, but also in, in Southeast England, are the kind of more calcareous and chalk, chalk streams? Yeah, I think uh, the Midland Mears tend to be a more stable environment you know they've been those mirrors since post glacial times they create their post glacial wetland features and okay some of them have got drainage ditches around some of the fen meadows have got ditches and drainage and you know there has been a there's been a some modification but overall i think they've generally been more stable than the southeastern rivers which have been quite heavily impacted by severe flood events. I mean, I'm sure you remember the flooding we had in summertime. Uh, was that 2012? I don't know the exact date, but prolonged flooding at an unexpected or unusual, shall we say, time of year when the snails are actually in their full reproductive cycle. But the sedge is flooded, they're all dislodged, you know, there's not much transitional habitat because the floodplains are drained and improved and the fen is a narrow band either side of the river so very exposed to all these extreme events within the river itself and um, so anywhere where rivers have been impacted like that in the southeast so not just the Avon sack but the other rivers yes they are going to be suffering from similar trends um, the East Anglian situations are perhaps slightly better in terms of slightly less modified but um abstraction is an issue in east anglia um so some of those chalk streams and fens are impacted by the groundwater level actually decreasing for prolonged periods of time and the trend being towards drying of those fens and and streams because of over abstraction i think that's slightly less of an issue in the southeastern rivers because they tend to be a bit bigger but um they're impacted by these climatic events and by the excessive amount of drainage we've done so it's not just the the climatic events but the fact that the water just runs off so quickly that's what we've design those floodplains to do that's what the farmers want to get rid of the water as fast as possible so it all ends up in the river and whoosh all your fen edge species are just blasted for you know and often at an inappropriate time of year so yes mostly <laughs> i think is the answer to that question <laughs> yeah. yeah that's fine that's that's kind of what i assumed but um mm. yeah good to see good to understand mm. that thank you but yeah really interesting presentation and looking forward to spending some time out next week yeah, do you think you've got some other sites that have um, the species that you know about or 
good fan where it's possible. National it Trust be. sites. Yeah. Um, not the the one. Not that I'm aware of. I guess maybe may down in Herbeck potentially. We've got um, more extensive kind of wetlands down there, but not but yeah, not really big sedgy areas. Mm. Um, there's another small bit of the River Avon up at, up at Avebury, which, um, mm-hmm. well, there's the River Kennet actually up at Avebury, but a very yeah. small section of yeah. Winterbourne. Yeah. But so, yeah, I don't think so. We don't have that much sort of riparian or fern habitat in this part, but maybe yeah. there'll be some other sites. I'll give it give it some thought, definitely. Yeah. Okay, great. You'll have to, you'll have to discover some new ones, Stephen. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's always an incentive, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> even if you find, you know, the, the other vertigo species, they are indicators of quality habitat. It, they are still good records, you know, if you find other vertigos. I wonder as well whether, um, you know, Neil might find some on some of his river sites, which, you know, yeah. sort of in, in a sort of Swindon area. But Yeah, you know, he, no pressure, Neil. <laughs> he, he's looking after quite a lot of um, waterways with his volunteers and so he's making the habitat much better so maybe he will find some there who knows <laughs> um yeah it'd be interesting to know if there are any records in north wiltshire yeah, yeah i don't know whether you use nbn atlas much but the full data set from the conchological society is available via the nbn atlas so okay. you should be able to get the records off there. Right. Thank you. Um, it would be certainly interesting to do. I'll try to come out next Saturday. Um, I have to do some dormice checks and we're right in the middle of um, uh, breeding season. Mm. So I may not get away depending on how many dormice we find. Mm. But I'll try to get down there. I'm in that sort of area um, next um, Saturday. But it'll be interesting to look at Jones's Mill since um, management was um, changed there um, because the EN um, Hydrological Survey, Vegetation Survey, the um, leaked has not been repaired. So the leaked taking water onto the actual fen hasn't been um, repaired. So there's less water coming into the fenland. So. Okay, that was the main water supply, was it, via the Leet? Or is it also seepage? Um, there is seepage into there, but um, of course, being a fen, it's always been sort of man-made structure, really, or a mire. Mm. Um, so that Leet actually took water and um, spread that into the Fenland area. Right, I see, yeah. yeah. Uh, so when Martin Willing did his surveys at the reserve, uh, he was finding up to 100, 200 or so in samples. When I went in 2019, which again was a training day with Wiltshire Wildlife Trust, we were only finding up to a dozen or so in our samples. Um, so hopefully they've had good years since then. Um, yeah, but this year good. they would it would have been difficult for the species. So we'll see. Yeah, indeed. I think it's uh, it sounds as though it's quite important to get next Saturday's surveying started at least um you know yeah it's really it'll be really great if uh you know neil can come but you know he's very busy but at least if we do the survey um with us doing it yeah you know, we can sort of carry yeah. on and, and sort of yeah we can do it with neil later date so that'd be really yeah. good yeah so come equipped if you can uh, to actually practice the sampling technique yeah definitely yeah. And it's uh, just just to confirm, it's half past ten at Jones's mm-hmm. Mill um, on the eighth of October, so next Saturday. Um, and it should be really interesting. And hopefully, you know, we can we can we can find the species and maybe uh, provide some good information to uh, you know the conservation team so they can look into it. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, are you um able to bring trays and things like that or are we expected to bring i haven't booked on it yet but i've been That's inspired right. by this <laughs> this yeah. soon yeah um, so what what i can bring obviously my well is and all this that and the other but is there anything you're supplying to help out um i'll be very honest i haven't got i haven't got many trays and things i've got a couple you know and um I expect Max will bring maybe a couple as well. I've got two, basically. Yeah. So yeah. I ha- hopefully uh, there should be enough enough for us to, you know, either be eating and sieving and looking 
and sort of sharing it out between us so we all get a different a bit of yeah a yeah we can take turns yeah well, i think i've got yeah. some old cat lit trays anyway that i've been using in the garden i can clean oh them. yeah that's fine yeah <laughs> yeah try and yeah. clean them first but... yeah definitely <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just just to make it sort of even more interesting when we did the uh, last when max kindly came to to sample and we did some more of surveying there you know um uh, max and tom who uh uh, is with the Conchological society we found 33 species of, of mollusk at sample and um you know, both Max and Tom are so enthusiastic and and uh, they make, really sort of uh, make you sort of interested in all the species that we find. So I'm sure along with Desmoulin, which is what we're trying to find, we'll find lots of other interesting species as well. So that'd be really Yeah, fun. absolutely. Good point, Michael. Yeah, we'll, we'll see lots of species and, you know, we can look at all of those and practice keying out etc even if we don't find a single desmoulins there'll be lots to see and enjoy and learn yeah i'm, I'm sure, sure we will know is there a key that we <laughs> could download to bring with us um do you know of? um i might have a sneaky pdf i can email to michael something i would have prepared for previous training courses i'll have a look angela um it's just a thought. It's a, an easy, quick reference guide while we're there because I haven't got the books or anything. So. Yeah, or I might even have printouts that, again, are a hangover from a previous training mm -hmm. session. Okay. Thank you. That'd be great. Okay. okay. Um, if, if we, we haven't got, got any more questions, you know, I know it's a Friday, a, a Sunday afternoon, so I'm sure we're all yeah. keen to uh, get yeah. off and have our Sunday. Enjoy Sunday our Sunday. Or something. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So I uh, just wanted to say, you know, real thanks to Mags for, for producing the presentation with, uh, along with help from Martin. And um, thanks for all of you for, for, for joining in because, uh, you know, it's good to get uh, interest in such a sort of specific species. And hopefully if we survey and try and find it, then, you know, what we'll have to is to try and uh, look after the species. So thanks everyone. Yeah, and, uh, brilliant. See you. Lovely to see you all. Tonight. Yeah, Thank hope you. to see you again Thank soon. You. Thank, Thank you very much. You. See you later, Bye. Michael. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.